countdown to eternity starts now. Well, hello, my dear brothers and sisters. I want to welcome you to another episode of Countdown to Eternity. And we have got a lot to talk about today because there is so much news that is coming in on a regular basis relevant to Bible prophecy. And this one is no exception. Now, Today, we are going to talk about an article that just came in, yes, in Politico, that says American and British forces carry out large-scale strikes on Houthis in Yemen. Yes, folks, that is correct. It is an accurate title, and that is something that is happening and has happened as we speak. American forces with British forces and uh, many others have decided to go into Yemen and to deal with with a terrorist organization that, by the way, the United States of America recently declared the Yemeni Houthis to not be terrorists. That's something that President Biden did uh, many years ago when he first came into office as our president. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I think what's more critically important here, and by the way, we are going to play a video for you. This is a critical video from Davos, yes, at the World Economic Forum meeting with the United States Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, and you will be blown away to hear what he says. And it is amazing how aloof people are when they are not walking with God. But the Bible makes this clear. We know we are going to see an increase of anti-Semitism in the last days. We know we're going to see an increase in uh, persecution of believers in the last days. This is not something that should be unfamiliar territory to us. But let me start by reading a passage from Zechariah chapter 12. Now, I'll read the first three verses, and it says this. It says, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. And it is absolutely amazing when you begin to see the start or the commencement of the fulfillment of these words that were shared by Zechariah. And make no mistake about it, when Zechariah speaks about these things on behalf of Almighty God, he undoubtedly does not understand the full implications of what would one day happen thousands of years later. But make no mistake, we are watching the manifestation of many of these things begin to formulate. I can tell you this, we are watching the theater begin to expose itself, begin to unravel for the very things that Zechariah spoke about, Daniel spoke about, Isaiah spoke about, and many of the other prophets. And so it's interesting because before we get into this article, I should point out what I have already mentioned, and that is the fact that our own president of the United States, shortly after he was inaugurated, within days of the time that he was inaugurated, went out of his way to take the Yemeni Houthis, who are, by the way, proxies of Iran, specifically positioned against not just Israel, but Saudi Arabia. They went out of their way to declare the Yemeni Houthis as no longer enemy combatants, or for lack of a better term, no longer a terrorist organization. Now, that did a lot of very, very bad things, namely with Israel and with Saudi Arabia. You have to keep in mind Saudi Arabia is in direct conflict with Iran. The Yemeni Houthis are uh, proxies of Iran and have done everything they could to make things extraordinarily difficult for the Saudis in the southern portion of the Arab Peninsula. And this is a very important detail to keep in mind because when the United States of America did what they did, some of you might say, well, come on, James, big deal. They're just simply declaring these people to no longer be enemy combatants. Maybe they're trying to make peace. The problem with doing that is you know for a fact, and this is something we know, it's published, it's well-documented in, well information, so much of Saudi Arabia's military budget has gone on or gone into the United States of America. And the United States of America has very specific rules about how the weapons that we supply our allies can and cannot be used. And one of the issues that are related to rules of engagement directly center around who we define as enemies and who we define as allies. And specifically, we have 
uh, these contingencies that are set in place that keep people who buy weapons from us from using those weapons against people we declare to be non-combatants. So when the Yemeni Houthis were declared as such to be in that position, the United States of America tied down the hands of Saudi Arabia, and it also tied down the hands of Israel in being able to deal directly with the Houthis, even in a preemptive manner. Now, that's very, very bad. And of course, it created the kind of condition that we're actually watching materialize right now before our faces. But even more than that, what it actually did was it began to disrupt the region in the southern uh, area of the Arab Peninsula, as well as many other areas that are right there near the Sinai, near the Red Sea, on the, of course, as we would say it, the eastern coast of Africa, and many other areas around the Mediterranean, and of course, the Persian Gulf. It creates a big problem. And when we talk about the predictions of Bible prophecy, it makes even more sense because we are watching Saudi Arabia, even with everything going on with uh, Gaza and Israel, making very distinct decisions to seek to further the normalization potential with Israel in order to create a stronger alliance against Iran and, of course, against their enemies to the south. They're also very much being supported in this because of the fact that the uh, the boats going through the Red Sea into the area of the Sinai, through the Suez Canal, into the Mediterranean, it affects everything. And there's a lot of people who are affected by this. And of course, that brings us into Ezekiel 38, which of course, we know that there will be people who will attack Israel in a conglomerate of nations. But what's interesting in Ezekiel 38 are the people that don't speak up or the people that don't get involved, right? Of course, Egypt is not named there. But what's even more interesting than that are the people who will physically object to these things. And we know Saudi Arabia objects to it. They won't involve themselves in the war, according to Ezekiel 38, but we know that they will object and it creates for a very interesting geopolitical scenario, which is manifesting right now. So all of these things related to Zechariah chapter 12, Ezekiel chapter 38, the things that we read about in Daniel and many areas of Isaiah and all over the Bible, they are beginning to manifest dramatically. So let's put this all together. Let me read a portion of this article, knowing this background and knowing this history and knowing where we're going with this. Let me read what it says here in this article. It says this, the U.S. and U.K. conducted a large-scale air and missile strikes on Houthi rebel facilities across Yemen on Monday, according to a joint statement. Now, of course, by the time you are uh, listening to this or watching this, this is two days old, okay? So this is something that's happening at the time that I'm recording this, which, of course, is Monday, January the 22nd, Okay. So it goes on to say they are stepping up operations against the militant group as it vows to continue attacking ships in the Red Sea. Isn't it amazing how they are still referring to it as a militant group and not a terrorist organization? I think it's remarkable how they continue to classify things as such in the name of seeking not to involve themselves in the defense of Israel. It's amazing. But it goes on to say this, the U.S. and U.K. militaries with support from Australia, ready for this, listen to this, Bahrain, which I can tell you this right now, Bahrain is not getting involved unless they're pushed to do it by the royal family of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, okay? Very important to note that. So they're getting support from Australia, Bahrain, Canada, and the Netherlands hit eight Houthi targets in Yemen in response to the Houthis' continued attacks, according to a joint statement from the countries involved. The precision strikes were intended to disrupt and degrade the capabilities that Houthis used to threaten global trade and the lives of innocent mariners. That's the joint statement that was released. Pretty much the U.S. military is the one that kind of puts that type of statement together. We know that that's under the, uh, uh, under the direction of the Secretary of Defense, which uh, it's, just, it's just amazing to think about that. Anyway, it says this. It says the joint strikes targeted a Houthi underground storage site and targets connected to the Houthis' missile and air surveillance capabilities, according to the statement. The underground bunker contained more advanced weapons than the facilities targeted in the coalition's initial strikes this month, according to a senior military official who, like others, interviewed for this story was granted anonymity to speak about sensitive operational details. Now, here's the quote. Our aim remains to de-escalate tensions to restore stability in the Red Sea. Uh, they go on to say, but let us reiterate our warning to Houthi leadership. We will not hesitate to defend lives 
and the free flow of commerce in one of the world's most critical waterways in the face of continued threats. This is really interesting because I want you to understand that the stand of this coalition has nothing to do with the position of Israel. Rather, it has everything to do with the concern that they have for economic issues. Now, this should be important because we know that it will be economic variables that will drive the very attack that Israel experiences that we read about in Ezekiel 38. So all of these geopolitics really make a lot of sense. Now, if you really want to understand what the United States' view, at least this current regime in office, what their view is concerning what's happening in the region, I want you to listen to about a three to four minute clip related to Antony Blinken and what he says at Davos 2024. Now, I want, I want everybody to understand this. This is the World Economic Forum. They are losing a footing. They are. I, I promise you they are. Uh, especially because of so much of the disorder and discontent and all the crazy things that are happening around the world. But the move for globalism is still growing. It is not weakening. It is actually growing. And the World Economic Forum this year brought in a lot of people actually opposed to them, which was interesting. And we're going to do some coverage on that. We're going to talk about that quite a bit. But I want you to listen to what Antony Blinken says. Now, I want to also remind everybody of this. The United States of America is inconsequential in Bible prophecy. We know that. America is not mentioned in Bible prophecy, right? Now, my prayer is the reason why the United States of America is not mentioned in Bible prophecy is because of the fact that we are inconsequential by virtue of the fact that we have vacated the nation because of the rapture. That's my prayer, right? But we still have an obligation to fight the good fight. We still have an obligation to stand up for righteousness. We still have an obligation to speak out about these things. But I want you to understand how biblical precedent is being set here. I want you to understand how we are watching Bible prophecy unfold in front of us. And at the bare minimum, we are seeing the stage being set for what we know is going to happen in that region. So listen to what the Secretary of State says, who, by the way, is the single most influential variable in the region right now concerning everything that's happening with Israel and everything that's happening with Gaza and everything that's happening with the group of Palestinians that exists within Judea Samaria. This is very, very important. And I don't know why, I also want to make something very, very clear. What's happening in Gaza right now is very misunderstood by a lot of people. I myself being the son of a mother and father who were both born and raised in Egypt, was raised hearing stories about Gaza because my mom was a missionary in Gaza for many, many years. And I remember hearing so many of these stories. And it's interesting, I also was raised with stories about Yemen because my mom also ministered there before she married my father. Those are some important uh, steps in being able to understand the dynamic of what's happening and how much has actually changed but when you stop for a moment to reflect upon all of the dynamics that exist here, you need to understand these things are not minute details. They are incredibly important details, as small and as insignificant or inconsequential as they may seem because of where we are geographically. They are huge with respect to what we read about in the Bible. Go back to what we read about in Zechariah. Go back to what we read about in Ezekiel. Go back to these passages, and it will make a lot more sense, a lot more sense. So let's pay attention to what's being said here. This is at Davos, and uh, this line of questioning is just, it's remarkable, and uh, we'll listen to it for a little bit, and then we'll jump back into closing thoughts and some ideas as to how this all comes together. So let's take a listen. Klaus, thank you, um, and Mr. Secretary, it's great to be with you here this morning. Um, I want to begin with um, a real black and white contrast in the morning news, you know, reading the papers. Um, one, on one side, you read about the power these days, Mr. Secretary, of the, these small units, Houthis, who can disrupt global shipping. Um, Hamas, on day 105 of the war, still firing rockets at Israel. Um, and on the other hand, um, I know that the diplomacy is going forward in the Middle East. We had the Saudi foreign minister saying publicly yesterday here in Davos that Saudi Arabia remains committed to um, a normalization with Israel under the right terms and opportunities for a Palestinian state. Talk to me about the tension between those two trends now unfolding. 
By the way, I, I just want everybody to understand something with respect to the issue of the Palestinian state and the contingencies that Saudi Arabia is placing with respect to that. The foreign minister of Saudi Arabia is saying what he says because he has to say that. But the reality of it is Saudi Arabia has a very vested interest in seeing the uh, Hamas be destroyed. They have a very vested interest in this. They also understand the fact that they know that the issues in Judea and Samaria are not going to be resolved based on what the Palestinian Authority wants because the Palestinian Authority wants the elimination of the Jewish state, not just the Jewish state, but the Jews. Let me just make myself clear. If they were to vote right now in what everybody calls the West Bank, that's the area of Judea, Samaria, right? Right now, 73% of the population would vote Hamas into office. That's a very important statistic to understand. Why? Because they believe in the mantra from the river to the sea. They want to eliminate Jews. So Saudi Arabia understands this. If you look at the recent statements of Mohammed bin Shailamin, uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, he'll say the exact same thing. He is insinuating, he has to say it very carefully for diplomatic reasons, but he is insinuating that he is more committed to the idea of a normalization agreement being solidified, actually says that there's already a bit of a normalization agreement that has, in, has been un, informal with uh, Israel, but he's more committed to the formalization of this normalization agreement than he ever has, and yes, is willing to provide concessions for the Palestinians, but the reality of it is he's not going to give them veto power. And I, I, Look, Netanyahu makes this very clear. Uh, we know that there are many people from within Israel that understand this. Saudi Arabia understands this. It would seem as though Antony Blinken doesn't. Okay, I just, think, I just want to say that. It's really important. So let's take a listen to this answer, and um, I, I, I just think it's going to blow your mind. Okay, here we go. Well, Tom, first of all, it's wonderful to be with you, to be with everyone here today. And Klaus, thank you for your incredibly warm uh, and generous words. Look, on one level, Tom, what we're seeing and what you've seen and written about for a long time is the evolution of something that's been in the works for quite a while, which is with the advent and the democratization of technology, information technology, you have super-empowered groups, super-empowered entities that can make an extraordinary amount of trouble uh, for, for nation states and others. Uh, and we're seeing that. But I think we're also seeing something else. Um, and if you, you... By the way, if you've not picked up on that statement, that is him directly attacking Israel. Okay, whether or not anybody wants to admit it, you can go back and analyze the terminology reflected there. He is certainly, certainly attacking the actions of Israel. Whether or not anybody wants to admit it or see it, that's what he's doing. Make no mistake about it, but let's continue on. You, you look hard enough, you can really see it. And it's a different equation. A different equation that answers the profound needs of virtually everyone in the region, starting with Israel and starting with its age-old quest for genuine security. Uh, and it's this. You now have something you didn't have before, and that is Arab countries and Muslim countries, even beyond the region, that are prepared to have a relationship with Israel in terms of its integration, its normalization, its security, that they were never prepared to have before, and to do things, to give the necessary assurances, to make the necessary commitments and guarantees, so that Israel is not only integrated, but it can feel secure. Um, but you also have an absolute conviction by those countries, one that we share, that this has to include a pathway to a Palestinian state, uh, because you're not going to get uh, the genuine integration you need, you're not going to get the genuine security you need, Absent that. Um, and by the way, I, I want to stop everybody to say this. He is not being truthful or sincere, okay? At best, he is carrying a very, very uh, pretentious approach to what he's saying and a very simplistic approach. The problem with the idea of a two-state solution that exists within Israel right now is you would be asking Israel, in essence, to allow a state to exist within its borders that is committed to the elimination of the Jewish state and to the elimination of all Jews. So you have a problem very similar to that of what was brewing in Gaza with, uh, um, with Hamas. And we also have to understand that when, even when you look at the function of the Palestinian Authority, they themselves are being fueled 
by proxies of Iran. And when you start looking at the things going on to the north with Hezbollah, and you look at the things happening with Lebanon, you see what's happening in Gaza, all of these people are being fueled by Iran. And a lot of the Arab world does not like that. Look, we have to think about this with some clarity, right? Iran represents the Shiites. A lot of the Arab world that opposes Iran, they are the Sunni and their fastest pathway to be able to mount up a strong defense against Iran is to develop normalization with Israel. They know that. They were convinced of that by the Trump administration. There was a lot of conversation that went back and forth regarding that. And Saudi Arabia knows that it cannot achieve the level of economic uh, uh, growth that it wants unless it develops that normalization with Israel. By the way, Egypt supports it because Egypt already has a peace treaty with Israel. Islamic Brotherhood has been pushed out by the current president of Egypt. Of course, we know that the Islamic Brotherhood created Hamas. We know that they're the same people. And we also know that Jordan, whether or not they want to admit it publicly as well, has a vested interest in seeing stability in the region, not because the Palestinian state wants what it wants and gets what it gets, but because of the fact that there is a genuine security that is managing some of the critical areas of Israel, namely the Golan Heights and some of the areas on the uh, Syrian border and so on and so forth. And I haven't even begun to discuss the issue of Russia. Okay, so let me play the last 30 seconds to a minute or so of this, and then we'll close up with an idea here of where to go with this and, and kind of what we're looking at. And of course, to that end as well, a stronger reformed Palestinian authority that can more effectively deliver for its own people has to be part of the equation. But if you take a regional approach and if you pursue integration with security, with a Palestinian state, all of a sudden you have a region that's come together uh, in ways that answer the most profound questions that Israel's tried to answer for years and what has heretofore been its single biggest concern in terms of its security, Iran, is suddenly isolated along with its proxies and will have to make decisions about what it wants its future to be. I would strongly disagree with him. I think we all understand where he's going with this because what he doesn't realize or what he does realize but he's not willing to be honest about is the existing Palestinian state or what we call the future of the Palestinian state, right? When we talk about the Palestinian state, I refer to the Palestinian Authority, they themselves are being fueled by the ideals of many of the people in Iran. And when we talk about the weapons that they're utilizing and a lot of the functions that they are beginning to put into place with respect to security is coming from those proxies. They have open uh, and close relationships with Hamas. They have open and close relationships with Hezbollah. Some of you might say, whoa, 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 stop, James. What do you mean? The Palestinian Authority has relationships with Hamas? Yes, as of late, they do, believe it or not. And there is a, a, an avid support for their actions. What's funny about it is they might not publicly talk about it, and it might not be something that you'll hear a lot, a lot out in the open, but they are working together, right? So this is very important to understand. Now, the summary of all of this is to stop and to say, look, read the Bible. As we read the Bible, we look at what's going on. We know what to expect. We know what we're going to be seeing. We know everything that we should be seeing around us to formulate, and we are looking at the stage being set. And it's interesting that Antony Blinken would talk about this in the World Economic Forum from the perspective of a regional approach, when in reality, the whole philosophy and ideal of the World Economic Forum is globalism and everything that goes with it. Again, we are talking about a one-world government intern into a one-world philosophy, ideal state, one-world currency. Where, look, it's all moving in that direction, and we are seeing evidence of it starting with what we're seeing in the Middle East. So, folks, we've run out of time, and I wish that we could be spending more time on this. We will actually dedicate many more shows to this subject because there's a lot to talk about. I hope that you've enjoyed watching this and listening to it as much as I've enjoyed making it. May God richly bless you. We love you so much. We honestly, I do not minimize the honor and the privilege that you give me to listen to the things that I have to say. May God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Countdown to Eternity. We love you so much and look up because Jesus is coming soon. God bless you. Thanks for joining us on this week's Countdown to Eternity. We want to encourage you to visit jamescadiz.com to find additional content and resources to equip you for the spiritual battle that we fight every day.
You can also subscribe to James Cadiz over on YouTube and Rumble. If you'd like to support Pastor James and his family directly, visit jamescadiz.locals.com and subscribe there. You'll gain access to exclusive content, daily devotionals, and more. Countdown to Eternity is listener-supported. Until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you.